Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar with Cisco Modernizing Your Data Center, Eliminating IT Process Integration Work. We are very excited to have Cisco joining us today. But we've, before we get started, I'm going to go through a couple of quick logistical details. All lines will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the show, but we do want to hear from you. So please post your questions early and often in the WebEx Q&A uh, chat window, actually, to your right, and we'll get to as many as possible doing, during the session and the formal Q&A at the end. In addition, we will be sending you a link to the recorded show shortly after the event for your review. With that, let me hand it over to Kent Erickson, our Senior Cloud Product Manager at Xenos. Kent, the floor is yours. Let me pass you the ball. Thank you. There you go. And uh, Russell, would you mind going off mute? I think you're going to, since you're going to be joining me here. Great. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I'm in one. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So this is the abstract, and uh, you probably read that already. So we'll, just, we'll move right on into the content here. Uh, Russell, one of the things that we're seeing out of the, this move towards the next generation data center, we'll describe what that is in just a second, but it's, it's where it's the soft, people call it the software-defined data center. They call it the virtualized data center. It's all of the new and emerging technologies that are out there like Cisco UCS and VMware and the, the new NetApp. NetApp clustering support and all of the things that enable us to have shared everything data centers. But really we focus, what we're driving this is a lot of focus from the business on some big business needs like delivering new applications quickly and, um, and meeting the needs of customers first, not on IT first, and on really being able to manage the expenses from a, as a sense of, Look, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to use the capacity we have, not just buy more capacity reflexively. Russell, do you want to chime in a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Kent, just so I can uh, let everyone know who I am, I, I actually my name is Russell Fishman. I work at Cisco. I'm a uh, senior manager in the uh, cloud systems development unit. So uh, basically, what my organization does is we uh, we work with uh, key partners uh, to develop. Uh, what we call Cisco validated designs. They're these uh, standard Cisco approaches to key elements of, of cloud. And uh, the reason I'm here today is because we have a very strong relationship with, uh, with Xenos and we have worked with them to co-develop um, a next generation cloud service assurance solution, uh, which is called Xenos Cloud Service Assurance. And um, you know, as part of that, I thought, you know, it was probably worth us spending some time uh, with the field and giving you guys some, uh, some visibility into the, the sorts of decision-making processes that Cisco have taken as we've looked to the market to build this class-leading cloud assurance solution. So I think, um, I think you started hitting the nail on the head, Kent, in terms of the sorts of things that Cisco looks at when we look at cloud because, you know, people talk a lot about next generation data centers and, and what that really means in terms of the impact on service assurance is maybe not instantaneously obvious. And as we go through this, um, this webinar, hopefully we can start explaining some of the uh, specific characteristics of cloud that Cisco have found at least that are, are distinctly different from the, the, the things that we have traditionally got used to when it comes to data center service assurance. So I, I think you started hitting on a couple of points here. Um, definitely, uh, you know, when people think cloud, they think about uh, having things uh, uh, rap very rapidly, very fast, very quick, uh, very little uh, specific human interaction, a lot of orchestration automation. Uh, but the expectation of, 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 of a very high level of service is still there. And we all, of course, you know, when anyone's talking about cloud, they tend to be talking about how to reduce the overall TCO for any particular workload. So all those things are themes that we will continue to discuss as we go through this deck. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit on the next generation data center. And we have a diagram on the left that kind of lays out some of the bigger parts. But as I said, it's the idea is that all of the applications, instead of having dedicated hardware, are using pools, uh, virtualized pools of resources. Um, and there's a, a lot, tremendous amount of infrastructure standardization, and that means we can redeploy these, these resources on demand. Russell, 
Yeah, I'm no, like, absolutely. And one of the things you guys have done is is defined a lot, predefined a lot of the uh, engineering relationships that need to exist on the left hand side. That's absolutely, and, and uh, th there may be people on the line that are aware of of, of Cisco's approach to cloud, but but certainly one of them is uh, is is a solution that we call uh, the Virtualized Multi Service Data Center, or VMDC. And it's it's a it's a Cisco validated design that we make freely available on the web. You can just go to cisco.com and, and grab a copy of this. We actually have um, several iterations of, of of VMDC, and and VMDC provides um, the basis for uh, secure multi-tenant uh, cloud uh, network containers, compute and storage um, in a holistic end-to-end -end tested system. Um, and so, you know, it's it's kind of interesting that you know Cisco makes this kind of freely available to anyone. Anyone can literally go on, grab this documentation. They can use it. They can build uh, secure multi-tenant data centers using this uh, design guide. And so, obviously, when we started talking about uh, having a service assurance solution that was best in breed and was built to support cloud, we obviously looked to the uh, the standard architecture that Cisco uses when we build clouds, and that is VMDC. I mean, VMDC is uh, is definitely one of our predominant uh, multi-tenant cloud architectures that we use. And so, the, what we've been working with Xenos on, as we will talk about this as we move on, is to have a uh, service assurance solution that literally does our cloud end to end. I mean, and that's the critical thing. And, and what you get out of the box and what you don't have to customize, I mean, it, it, it is really a huge investment that, that Xenos and Cisco have made together. I think right. to your point, Ken, you know, when you look at that next generation data center design and we talk about cloud, there's a lot of things in there, right? I mean, that's the reality. There's a lot of different products, even from the, the Cisco portfolio or from, or from Cisco's key partners, there's a lot of stuff in there, yeah? And it's all, you know, when you actually connect it all together, it can be a fairly complex pr uh, domain to manage, right, with a, a single tool. Um, and uh, that's exactly what we've managed to achieve with, with Xenos uh, Cloud Service Assurance. Yeah, now, Russell used a couple words there, uh, tenant, virtual, multi-service, cloud, that make it sound like this is something that only a service provider who's building a public cloud infrastructure would use. But in fact, this is a, a general unified data center design that, that is perfectly appropriate for enterprises too, correct? A hundred percent, yeah. So it's it's a common misconception, I guess, that when people hear the phrase multi-tenancy, they think, well, I'm not a service provider, you know, I'm not a telco, it doesn't really matter to me. But how often do you find in a business that you need to separate out different groups of information, either due to uh, maybe legal or regulatory reasons, maybe it's just different physical business groups or, for, or internal security within your organization, HIPAA compliance, PCI, there are many, many reasons why organizations need to separate out uh, th th these, these groups of information. So when you say, when I say tenant, you could replace that word with internal customers or departments or business units or whatever the appropriate terminology is. But no, very good point, Ken. Okay, great, great. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the, what people are using for the IT operations. And I know, I know that I've heard often, well, we already have a set of IT management tools, and there's there's a couple of big things that people, they've got people who've got that kind of ITEL-ish design that's on the upper left diagram there. Um, they've got centralized managers of managers and they've got service desks and those components. And then pretty much everybody has a bunch of uh, tools that handle individual technology silos. Um, I have a NetApp, uh, NetApp uh, manager in the middle there. I have a UCS manager in the bottom. So Russell, what, what, about, what about using those tools on the next generation data center? Yeah, well, it, that's a really great question. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely challenging, right? So it would be difficult for me to say it's impossible. I mean, nothing's really impossible if you put, if you put enough money behind it, but, but it's very, very challenging to do it, right? Um, you know, uh, this is a, we talk about cloud, there's lots of different components in there. Those components, when they come together, they make a system. And really, when we talk about cloud as a system, we're talking about managing the whole system as, as a single combined entity. 
Um, so the, the key, key thing here is, is that we need a single pane of glass, a single way to correlate all the different events that are coming uh, from the various parts of the infrastructure. Uh, we, we can correlate them and, and understand the root cause in a, in a unified fashion that really uh, matches uh, the cloud infrastructure and architecture. So to that end, let, let me tell you what we, we, Cisco certainly looks at it this way, is that when it comes to service assurance, we found the best way to go about it in, in environments that are already existing, inherently complex environments with people already having assurance tool sets, absolutely understand that. But when it comes to deploying cloud, our belief is that if you deploy a specific assurance solution against the cloud that manages the cloud end to end, you can northbound it. You can uh, you can pass that information up to your existing manager or manager if you have one, and you can do that in a way that means that you still get the integrity and, uh, and the understanding end to end within the cloud, but you don't lose that single pane of glass. You don't lose your existing investment in an assurance tool set. And, and you know, one of the things that we have seen with our customers is that where customers have tried to take existing assurance tool sets and apply them to cloud, they found that there are sp some very specific characteristics. I wouldn't describe them as nuances, but certainly things that are very um, uh, core to the whole concept of cloud that makes traditional assurance tool sets really struggle to, to do a great job of managing cloud. And I, I think we're probably going to talk about some of those things as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what we want to do is um, just remind everybody, first of all, that you're, if you, when, we, when questions come to mind, please enter them directly into the, uh, the Q&A window. We'll be answering those throughout the, uh, out, out this presentation, especially if they come to mind as we're talking about a particular section. Um, at the moment, what I'd like to do is, is pop up a polling question here. And so, Deanna, can you, can you pop up that polling question? We're, what we're kind of interested in knowing is what is the, the people who are listening here, what do their IT tool sets yet look like? And you know, I, I wrote these questions, so and, you know, the first answer is I'm pretty sure Alan Turing used the same set of IT management tools that we're running. Um, I've heard that actually from a couple of customers, maybe not Alan Turing, but they're, they're using software that's a, a decade old. Um, so go ahead and fill in these answers. Um, Russell, can you talk a little bit about the challenge that we were we were just talking about this the other day? The challenge of of using some of these older versions of software against this next generation stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, this is just this is what Cisco has seen. As we, you know, you, you, many of you are probably aware that Cisco is heavily involved in in building clouds for enterprises and service providers. And uh, you know, when we do that, we're inevitably asked how to operate these environments. I mean, that's where most of the money uh, goes, frankly. So that's obviously a you know a very reasonable question. And uh, you know, uh, when we when we go into uh, customers, often the their assurance tool set is almost like a religion. They're they're very wedded to it. There are people who have spent a lot of their lives on a particular assurance tool set. Um, generally, these assurance tool sets are pretty well embedded in existing environments, and that's a fantastic thing. I have no problem with that. But what the challenge is, is when we look to see how we can do a great job of managing and assuring a cloud infrastructure, what tends to happen is that we get the, the, the existing, the incumbent vendors, and they will always say, of course, we can manage a cloud. Of course, we can assure a cloud. That's no problems. What we tend to find when you kind of put, peel away the covers a little bit is that the, uh, the, the version that the customer is running is often is being in place for a couple, three, four years. I mean, most people don't go through enterprise management software upgrades unless they really need to. There's some really pressing need to. So it's not common that you would find someone who's only just deployed a new version of enterprise management. It sometimes happens, but it, it's definitely not common. And if you go back two or three years, these guys were struggling really struggling to deal with what I would describe as the very dynamic nature of cloud. It's just not something they were very good at. So what you'll find is there are, there are probably some vendors that can, you know, will say that they can do this, but what they, when they say that, what they're really saying is it has to be on their current version. And, it, and anyone who's gone through the, the relative hell of upgrading an assurance solution knows that it is not a simple task to move from, uh, you know, version N to version N plus one or N plus two. It can be a very considerable cost and effort exercise. So that's something also just to bear in mind as you start to plan uh, your assurance uh, and monitoring 
uh, plans, or, sorry, you're, you're monitoring uh, um, projects around uh, your clouds, that, that it's, it's, it's not something that's a simple add-on to most existing tool sets. Okay. Great. And so we have uh, some, our polling results, and it looks like, uh, well, the primary answer seems to be tons of tools, at least one for every manufacturer and technology. And that's something that we're, we're, we consistently see is that people are, are using a lot of tools. And I guess we'll talk in a minute about what kind of problem that creates. So, so let's, but you've been talking a little bit about some of the, the, the challenges with using old tools. Um, Russell, let's talk a little bit about the challenges for, for new, new tools. And, I think really the most interesting thing that we, we hear is that I've got all these new tools. If, if I've got a cloud in there, I've got a portal software, and I've got some orchestration software, and I've got lots of new hardware in there, but then I run into there's, I still have to operate it, and I can install it quickly, but I'm going to operate it for years. And so there, there are these questions that, that we're talking about, about what are some of the issues that, that tools really need to be ready for, and there's these emerging and modern data centers. Um, Russell, want to talk about those for a couple minutes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I think the slide is one of those ones where it actually really highlights some of the key issues and does a really good job of it. But I'm going to talk through some of those things. So, so firstly, you know, a anyone who's worked in IT operations for any length of time knows that, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, uh, these organizations that tend to be highly siloed. I mean, and that's just a, a fact of life. You have a network team, you have a storage team, you have a compute team, you have a security team, various application teams. Of of course, that's just the way these organizations have, have come to be. But of course, when we talk about highly unified architecture such as cloud, it kind of it's a kind of a nonsense to talk about it in these different domains. Yeah, I mean, you're when you're when you're really managing a single system, uh, the the lines between those different traditional silos are absolutely blurred. And so this is a challenge from lots of different perspectives, not just tooling. We're talking about tooling today, but of course it's a big challenge from things like uh, just just basic things like process and governance and and, and metrics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a whole bunch of things that you have to be very concerned about when you look to unified architectures from a from an IT manager perspective, but let, let, let's let, let's not forget tools. I mean, uh, it's it just as it's a nonsense to talk about three different types of change management procedure for different elements of a unified architecture like a cloud. It's just as much of a nonsense to talk about having three completely separate tools, completely completely separate panes of glass. Let's say uh, when you talk about managing uh, the this, these same unified environments. And that is, by the way, an absolutely not an easy thing to overcome. I mean, you will traditionally have uh, different uh, these different groups who are very used to their tools, and I'm sure that you know they're they're very wedded to them. They probably do a great job for what they've used to they have used to do but now these days when you're talking about unified architectures it just it just doesn't really make sense so you obviously have to look at something that can pull all those elements together in a, in a, in a single pane of glass in a way that actually matches the, the the system you're managing which is which is unified yeah, yeah. um when sorry did someone say something uh, I, I was just saying yes i apologize Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. And then, um, and then, so that's the first thing. The second thing, and, and, the, and the, one of the characteristics that really kind of makes cloud stand out from traditional um, IT management uh, operations, from an operations perspective at least, is uh, dynamic change. Um, cloud is all about self-service. It's all about continuously changing requirements, the flexibility to add and remove uh, resources, components as a uh, customer, a tenant, if you will, or an IT department or business unit want. So that is an area where most assurance tools really struggle. They, they try and uh, keep up with what's going on, but they, they're certainly from an impact modeling perspective, it, it, it's, it's a real struggle for them to, to keep those impact models up to date and, and, uh, and valid. So what that means is when something goes wrong, the assurance tool set often doesn't reflect the reality of, 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 of how the, the environment is configured, how those resources are allocated to various customers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another uh, major challenge. Uh, when it comes to uh, issues about you know, multi-tenancy, which is just the ability to have multiple groups or customers or business units or whatever IT departments using, sorry, departments using the various resources is that's just another another a layer of complexity can we be sure that when something goes wrong we know what 
group of people that is using my cloud, it, it affects. Do we know that? Or do we just see it as flat? Is it just a bunch of VMs? Are we relying on arcane concepts just like you know, um, uh, naming conventions for servers to try and work out who owns what? How can we be sure that, that, that people will name their resources appropriately? Yeah? And then when we talk about correlation, can we correlate um, uh, issues at a uh, individual uh, tenant level? So at a customer, or a business unit, or whoever's using that environment, can we do it at an individual tenant level? So that when we know something goes wrong, we know that it impacts a particular application, it impacts a particular customer, and, and is that up to date all the time? Is that something that's kept up to date automatically without manual intervention? So those can, are some of the kind of key areas that we have seen big challenges with traditional assurance tool sets. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in from our audience, Russell, and I'll, I'll get, to a, get to those in a minute. I do want to remind the rest of the audience that you can enter questions and answers, and we'll be answering them during, during, this, during the seminar here. What you, we've talked about these challenges from one aspect, Russell, which, which is uh, but there's another aspect to it, which is all of these these uh, new tools are, have very different APIs. They, we're representing not a single server anymore, but a single UCS system, which is going to have well thousands of CPU cores and terabytes of memory and many, many, many uh, virtual, many, many physical and virtual interfaces inside of it. A, Similarly, our single VMware farm can have thousands of virtual machines. And a lot of the issues that some of the management tools have is just representing these suddenly very large environments, particularly because these environments are software defined. And um, these have, that means that there are constant end-to-end -end changes throughout the system. P users are provisioning things. They're creating and displaying applications fast. And it's really critical that we are able to keep up with that. Um, Russell, uh, this makes makes total sense to you. Yeah, I mean, it's something that we've we've had to live and breathe. So it's something that you know they're pain points that we're very very aware of. So when we started this journey, you know, uh, looking at uh, different uh, different partners that might be able to help us uh, through this, you know, some of the challenges that we had were that you'd get tools that did a great job at SNMP but not great a great job at like next generation management API APIs like XML, for example. We would have uh, some partners that could do some element elements of of our VMD see the virtualized multi-service data center very strongly and other areas very weakly. So what we would end up with is this kind of hodgepodge of different strengths and weaknesses and no one that could really do it consistently. Um, and that's part of the reason why you know, we've, we've worked jointly with Xenos over the last 18 months to develop this uh, very specific capability to do the, the cloud end-to-end, -end, and we'll talk about a bit more about that in a minute. But the other yeah. thing you mentioned was this, this concept of um, these unified fabrics. Obviously, that's something that's very core to uh, systems like UCS. And, uh, you know, the, the challenge is that, you know, if you don't have an assurance tool set that understands, you know, the ability, the, the, the dynamic tenant nature of the way that these cloud environments are built, you end up with very flat views of, of, of the environment, which makes it very difficult to prioritize and triage when things go wrong, right? If you don't understand the context of, of, of a particular resource failing or, or a chassis failing or, you know, whatever it is that's going wrong, um, you can't prioritize your efforts. So if you just see something flat and it's just like a, a bunch of different resources going offline, you can't prioritize your IT, IT um, service restoration efforts. And that's, and that's another area that, that, you know, is obviously very close to our heart as we speak with our customers about the things that get them worried when we talk about these highly unified architectures. Right. Okay. Now, Russell, I want to give a, what's probably an overly simplistic example for this audience of taking some existing management processes in an existing data center and dropping in some converged infrastructure. It's, it's going to be obviously too simple, but I, I found it a useful way of, explain, of having, helping people explain what the general scope of the problem is. So let's say that we have an, an existing data center that's got a number of different operations processes and, and tools that are associated with them. And this is a fairly representative list. Some people will have some of them, some will have more of them. Now, when we start dropping in technologies, uh, like a UCS system down below, we're, we're now connecting this system to all of those up, upstairs processes with, with these 
these uh, APIs. And of course, UCS uses an XML over HTTP UI, and some of those older management tools will need to be upgraded in order to support that. Well, we've got to connect to each one of these to make this work. Now, the next thing we're probably going to add is VMware in there. VMware has its own UI, which is another non-traditional API. It's the vSphere API, and we've got to connect that into each one of these systems. Similarly, we have to connect our storage, maybe with uh, NetApps ONTAP or, uh, or an EMC SMIS, the storage management interface. And then, of course, there's some network components that support that fabric that are probably connected via SNMP. Once we add in more network components, now we're saying, oh, well, there's some NetLog and some NetConf, all these different protocols. And then we add in the, uh, the workloads that are on top of that. And here are just a Linux and Windows, pretty simple. But we're adding in some WMI and SSH. And there's a whole lot of different arrows there if I tried to connect those all individually. And each one of those is a, a little integration project on its own, and it can be quite, quite time consuming in order to accomplish this. Now, Russell, we worked with one customer jointly who, who looked at this and started pricing us and just said, you know, it's going to be cheaper from the start for me if I add in the Xenos cloud insurance and stick that in the middle. And it's already got all the interfaces down to the stuff, and I use down to the down to the stuff that's in that next generation data center. It's already managing that, and it's got a single interface that, that I can use to send data to any one of those for all of those different protocols down before down below. So I can just send SNMP traps up to any one of those top IP, IT operations processes that, that actually abstract all the data from down below and, and, and put it in there. And it's better than that because not only am I getting individual device alerts, but I'm getting in the context of the tenants or the customer applications that are running so that I know which customer application is affected so that I don't have to map the entire customer application in each one of those top-level tools just to understand what the alerts mean. Yeah, absolutely, and actually, the, the 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 key here is that let's not forget the assurance tool set in of itself is an application. You need to have people trained in it. You need to have people who can operate it. You need to have some to host it. There's a whole set of licensing issues around it, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But you know, it's, it's another thing you need to manage is the point. And uh, the more that you proliferate these tools, um, the, more that you ha the more of these different various tools that you can have in that space, the more complex it is to manage, right? The, the, you know, you, then, then what you end up having is lots of different people, each of whom are experts in these individual tools. It's very difficult to consolidate your IT management layer because at the end of the day, you have all these experts who, who, who are all each point uh, experts in these individual tools. With Xenos CSA the, and, and, and the joint work that Cisco and Xenos have, have conducted, the benefit of it is, is that you only have a single tool for your entire cloud. You have one tool that does it all, one tool that can manage all of the components within the VMDC architecture. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is a little bit of a demonstration to just show what a tenant service would look like. Show what kind of challenges you get when there's a, a problem, how many different technologies can generate alerts and pump them up, which means indicates if you are looking at one tool at a time and you see only part of the whole problem. We'll look at how um, Xenos can identify which services are affected and identify the root cause and what, what, what kind of single enriched event we would give both to somebody who's looking at the system individually as well as something that if I was integrating with those northbound, those, those top level services can present that. And I'll also show you how the, the dynamic model handles logical reconfiguration recovery tasks, which means things like vMotion. So I'm not going to, if I've got a big problem with a piece of hardware, I'm not going to fix the hardware before I fix the customer. I'm going to fix the customer first. And that means that my, man, my service assurance tool has to keep up. So that's a lot to demonstrate all at once. Um, okay, so let me jump over, and I guess I need to share something here. Share an application and jump over to Xenos. All right, and you should see the uh, Xenos application here. Um, I'm connected into my environment. And what, I, what I see right now, by the way, is a list of the, the customers and their applications that are running in, in my environment. So I've got a, a set of gold services. These are, these are people who are uh, paying more. They're important to me. I do a lot of monitoring for them. 
Uh, maybe I have redundancy built into them. And the good news here is that they're all up. I've got a set of uh, bronze services, a smaller set as it turns out in this, this environment. Uh, bronze services, maybe they don't have redundancy. There's the people I look at second. A lot of times I'll put test environments in a bronze level. And I've got an, an application that I'm going to look at. And I'll, I'll look at one particular application in here, a, a relatively simple one. It's called the Simple Website Application. And making this a little bit bigger just so that everybody can see this a little easier. That, that is a, a database server and a web server and a VLAN that's supporting it. Very simple application. All right, get back, back to a regular size. Now, what does that look like? So I, th I think of it as a very simple application. It looks like a couple of servers and a VLAN. But when I drop that into uh, this, this larger environment here, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, that website service, and I'll make this a little bit bigger so that everybody can see this easy, easily. That's uh, those, those same two, same two, same two servers. Each of them are virtualized, as it turns out. They're they're running on VMware, and all of this model below, everything below this top level that we've dropped in there, the VLAN and the two Linux servers, all of that is built and maintained by Xenos. So we see that that VLAN is supported by a Nexus 5000. Um, we see that these VMs are running on, as it turns out, two different hosts. Okay, those hosts are running on UCS blades that are in a UCS chassis, and the VMs are supported by data stores. Uh, this one is a high-speed data store that's supported by a LUN down to a one NetApp filer. Um, this one over here is a a, a, a basic data store. Uh, that's a, whatever that means, supported by a file system onto a filer. So it looks like we've uh, We've got a, uh, one is an NFS and one is a block storage device that are supporting these two things, which, which makes sense. They're, they're running a little bit different model. They're going to use something differently. The database server is using the, uh, the block storage to, to take full advantage of that. All right, so there's a lot of components to manage in this environment that are, that are across multiple technology stacks. So to know that this customer is running, we have to be able to track the operating system, the VMs, the, the VMware hosts, the UCS blades, the LUNs, the storage components, all of those things. Now, when something breaks in this environment, and I'm going to go ahead and, and simulate what a chassis down looks like. I'm not actually going to knock a chassis down. That would be kind of expensive. When, when a chassis goes down, a typical event console will pop up with a, a crazy number of events. And again, they're events from all over all over many different technologies. There's events from a UCS system that says, hey, there's a blade that's been shut down. There's events from a, 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 here the database server that says, I can't ping it anymore. There's VMs that are down. And you've got this problem that as you look at this, it's really hard to figure out who to call. It's really hard to figure out what the root cause is. And there's no notion of which of my customers have problems, which of my customer applications have problems right now. This is the problem that all of us face every day. It's actually made a lot easier in this case because all of these events came from that one problem, that UCS chassis going down. So if we were to just take, take these events and, and sort them properly and filter them properly and look at them in the right order, we would see the, the problem. But in a real environment, these events are scattered with many events that are coming in from lots of different, different systems at the same time. Now, if I jump back over to my uh, services, what I might want to do is look at my gold level services. And now I see that I've got some problems. I see exactly which of my customers are down. My simple website is down. My marketing is down. And I've got a couple systems that are at risk. Uh, Russell, at risk is a different state than we, we typically have because at risk says there's redundancy built into this application. That redundancy has failed with this outage. The customer may, probably doesn't even know it. But we're not able, if, if there was a second failure, that customer would have a problem. So we need to pay attention to these guys. We don't need to fix them first. What we need to do is go in and look at that, that simple website service that we were looking at and see, see what's going on with that. All right, looking at it at this level, I see both of the servers are down. That might be the kind of message you'd get on your page pager. Two servers are down. Or I'd rather you get two pages, one that each mentioned each of the servers. When I go back and look at this, um, this service graph, I see all of the different things that are down, the chassis, the blades, et cetera, although it looks like my storage devices are still up in my VLAN. That's good. Now, what I don't want to have to do is come in and look at this, this, look at this diagram to figure out what the problem is. What I'd like is to get a very simple explanation. 
And this is, the, this is what Xenos gives me. It gives me this message that says, hey, my service simple website is down. That's the message that might go up to my service desk. That's the message that, that might go up to my manager of managers. It's a customer-focused message that indicates that a, a particular customer has a problem. But we're better than that because what we send along with that, if I click on that, is the root cause that's associated with that message. So what is the root cause? Well, these are the events from that event console that are specific to the devices that were in that diagram that we just looked at. Okay? So no magic here. It's just a way of grabbing all of the events that are associated with those devices. Where the magic comes in is we also rank them in which is the most likely to be the root cause for this problem. And here the root cause is, is that this chassis, if I turn off, uh, I guess refreshes, let me set that at manual. If I turn off the uh, the root cause is, is determined by the lowest lowest item in there and the, the cause the likelihood that what, what of what the root cause of the problem is. So here this problem is caused by that chassis that went down as a result of that. Now, jumping back over here, let's how would we fix this in a real environment? We well we wouldn't go out and repair the chassis first because we'd have a number of customers who are down. Um, in order, and we, all those customers would be complaining while we waited for parts to come in and fix the chassis or however we're going to do it. So let me jump in and, and show you what the dynamic reconfiguration part of this is. So I've got these two VMs that are running on host 14 and host 28. And uh, normally you'd just probably set this up automatically in a demonstration environment. You never want to fix anything automatically. Let me just show you what would happen if we migrated off of host 14 and host 28. When we do that, we migrated over to host 31, and I guess we only did part of this on host 14. We got caught this in the middle. So Xenos now understands that host 31 is now up, and we kind of caught this in the middle of a refresh. And so it hasn't finished bringing up the VM or the, 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 the uh, operating system yet. But it is, it is now it got the right connection to the right device in there so that we see the problems that are happening, see, 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 see the problems that are are, are being fixed as they're happening. And if we go back and look up at my gold level services, because of the migration that we did, all of my gold level customers are now up and happy, even though I've still got problems in my infrastructure. I still have a UCS chassis that's down. So, Russell, we've really looked at how we can represent services and how we can look at, look at my, my, my complex cloud-ready infrastructure from a customer standpoint first rather than from an infrastructure standpoint first. And I think this is, this is the core of what, what Cisco was looking for when they said we need a service assurance solution for the next generation, uh, next generation data center. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We have a question that, that just came in that I think might be relevant to address as well here. Uh, can we see what the at-risk services look like in the load balance? Oh, sure. Um, and I just stopped sharing my application, so I'll, I'll jump over and look at that. And that's a question about, uh, I, um, Rob was asking, what happens if something is load balanced and what does an at-risk service look like? So I'll, I'll reshare my application and, and jump in and look at one of those. Um, so I had these HCS services that were at risk, and I will go ahead and uh, unmigrate, which, which, which may, make, may make this uh, broken again. So my service is now at risk. Okay, and uh, there's a couple of them in here. One is this uh, communications, and one is this website. So here's a good a good look at this. Um, this uh, redundant web this re this service has got. If I expand it all, it'll get really complex because there's lots of different components below that. I'm going to shrink it so that we can see a little bit about what's going on. All right. So I've got uh, a couple of this redundant website. It's very similar to my um, my other website. I've got a a web server, which is called my static content server. So I've got two redundant ones. And I've got a database server. Um, and I've got two redundant database servers. So this is what it looks like. I've got two, two devices in there to manage that. Now, how do we know that this thing is at risk and not down? Because normally I would say it's the worst of all of the components down. I'm down if any of my components are down. Instead, what we have is something called a, a policy gate, which we reach by, by clicking on this little G here. And a policy gate is a set, of, uh, a set of contextual policies that define what my target states are. And so I'm going to say this, this one is down if 100% of my dependents are down. 
and I'm at risk if 50% of my dependents are down. One of the things that's interesting about this is that these rules are true. They don't represent, they don't specifically call out db2.loc and db1-loc. It says 50% of whoever's in this group is down. So if I needed more capacity, um, frequently you do that for web servers. I need to go from two to three to four web servers to handle the load that's coming in. This rule is still going to be true. I may not need to tweak it, but an at risk says here that I've got this state that I'm going to call at risk just because one of these two of 50% of these guys are down. By the way, we have another state that I could add in that is called degraded. Um, so we've got up, down, degraded, and at risk. Degraded means that, well, say, let's say I had uh, three database servers in there, and, it, and if uh, two of them were, if, if, if only one of them was working, the service is still up, but the performance is going to be really bad. I might call that a degraded state. I'm not able to operate at full capacity. The service is still functioning. You know, not everybody's going to know that it's down, but it's going to be performing badly. So it gives us that, that third, that fourth state, up, down, degraded, and at risk. And I hope that answers the question about how these are. By the way, all of, the, all of these services can be created by simple script calls, including the policy gate. So that one of the things that we've worked on with a lot of Russell's customers is tying this into their uh, cloud orchestration system so that when somebody comes in through the cloud portal and creates a new VM, it creates the service that references that VM for that customer at the same time. So this whole left-hand tree view that's in here gets populated as automatically without any IT administrator needing to, uh, needing to do any work at all. Thank you, Deanna, for, for, for letting me know that. Um, we'll, there's a couple more questions in. We'll uh, get to those in just a second. Please go ahead and answer, answer more, uh, ask more questions in there. Okay. And uh, so, so the, other, the, other, the other challenge, and we've just looked at a little example of this, is we, we're supporting all these different customers with different resources that are connected, and we have to focus on the customer problems. Um, Russell, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the issues that we're facing, even though I guess some of the fonts don't quite fit on this slide here? Yeah, I, th I, think we, I think we've actually started to cover some of this in, in, in previous comments I've made. But, but you know, in essence, the, again, just you know, reaching back to the challenges that Cisco has seen as we've gone down this path of delivering you know, comprehensive service assurance for cloud, uh, the challenges that we've tended to have is, is all about understanding uh, how your resources in your cloud are carved up amongst the various tenants. Again, I, I, I always, as you quite rightly pointed out, Kent, always concerned about using the word tenants, but um, your various customers, your internal IT departments, whoever's using your cloud, um, your um, understanding that within the context of the assurance system is, 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 is tough. Tough, right and now don't get me wrong there have been obviously there's been a substantial move towards virtualization in the last few years and what that means is there are quite a few assurance tool sets are getting better at doing some of this especially around compute resources but let's remember there are other elements of your infrastructure that are equally carved up, yeah? whether they be network, compute, or storage. And when you talk about uh, delivering a cloud container to a particular customer, what you'll find, of course, is that those containers, they spread across multiple uh, different domains. And understanding within the assurance system, the relationship between a device that might host multiple customers and uh, um, uh, and, uh, and the way that the, the full and performance information is retrieved and managed by the assurance solution is absolutely critical. So, um, you know, we'll, I, I guess you've demonstrated some of that, but we, you know, the, the, the key here is, is as we look to jointly develop, uh, you know, the enhancements to the Xenos uh, platform to support the uh, Cisco VMDC solution, that's one key area that we focused on to ensure that we get that, that ability to look into individual devices, understand how resources are shared between multiple tenants, and get that visibility within a Xenos Cloud Service Assurance. Okay, great. So we've got a, our second poll question up here. And Deanna, if you can put the uh, poll question up there. Um, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to answer a couple of the Q&A. 
that are that are up there. Um, one of the questions up there is, gee, how do you keep these these Zen packs complete? What have what have you done? And I want to, Russell, I want to talk a little bit about that and have have us talk a little bit about what it is that we're doing jointly to develop these these the the support for the Zen packs. The Zen packs are the supporting code that that uh, supports applications and devices and develops and what it is that we're doing to support, we're working together to, to provide great support for this Cisco environment. Can, do, you, do, you, do you think that's something you could cover for a second? Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the relationship between Xenos and, uh, and, and Cisco has been around for a couple of years and it's really been a focus for the last 18 months in terms of the, the joint development. So, so what does that mean? So to give you an idea, the extent of the development that we do, uh, we have uh, engineers from, uh, from Xenos who actually you know, appear in the Cisco directory. Uh, Xenos and Cisco engineers work daily together in the development and extension of the, of the Xenos CSA platform. Uh, Cisco, uh, as part of, uh, part of the systems development unit within the engineering organization, we actually extensively test Xenos in real world scenarios, uh, and it's not just kind of a functionality perspective, but also from a performance and, and, and usability perspective to ensure that as we develop next generation releases for our class leading VMDC architecture, that Xenos is ready to go from day one. So uh, that is really the, the benefit of, of, of taking uh, Xenos CSA more than anything else is that you're getting, you're taking advantage of the significant investment that Cisco and Xenos have made in terms of, uh, of doing that joint development. Um, when, you know, if you were to go and have a look for VMDC on Cisco.com, you would see that there are multiple releases of VMDC and, and know that uh, Xenos CSA covers all of them, right? So, so it doesn't matter which which version you pick, depending on your specific needs, the benefit is is that Xenos has been tested and validated against each of them. Um, and, and not only do we provide the product, but we provide significant amounts of uh, documentation that enable you to do a great job of deploying it without the need necessarily for costly uh, services, engagements, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that, that we've given all the tools necessary uh, uh, free of charge to deploy it, and all you have to do is, of course, buy the, the, the Xenos product itself. Right. Now, there's another question that's related to that, which is, so we've done a lot of work with you that's, you know, my, my experience is that it's been very use case focused, not just technology focused. As you said, it's, it's focusing on real world scenarios. But one of the other questions here is, how well does this system work with non-Cisco hardware platforms? And I, I think the answer is that it works very well with those other platforms. However, with Cisco, we have this benefit of a year and a half of very tight relationships. And so not only, is, um, not only has there been a tremendous amount of knowledge transfer in the right way to do this, but that, that's made its way into the product. But, you know, Russell, frankly, I found that uh, you know, things like Cisco UCS are just head and shoulders above the competitors when it comes to the, the type of management information that's available. So I've, I've personally really enjoyed work, this, this experience in working deeply, deeply with you guys. Um, can, we, can we cut off the poll now um, just to see what the answers are? Yeah, we're shutting it down right now. It's, it's thinking. Okay, so about right. 10 seconds here. Okay. Yeah, let me just let me elaborate on what you just uh, th first. Thanks for the kind words, Ken. But uh, you know, uh, to be absolutely clear, you know, uh, when when Cisco brings VMDC, the virtualized multi-service data center, um, uh, to market, you'll, you'll note that it's in many ways multi-vendor, right? We have multiple vendors uh, represented in there. Um, uh, NetApp, EMC, VMware, uh, just a few of them, uh, Citrix as well uh, with their NetScaler product line. Um, so, uh, you know, already within the confines of VMDC, we are effectively multi-vendor, right? But that doesn't talk to all the other ex extra capabilities that Xenos, Xenos have outside of the support of VMDC, of course. Yeah, one of, one, of, one of the questions that came up during there is, hey, you left out something. There's, it's just not possible to keep up with all the changes that are going on, which is an answer that I loved. And I think a great example of that is that Cisco has just recently announced, and we're, we're starting to work together on a lot of virtual network equipment. 
And it used to be when you bought a, a, a switch or a router that you, I, well, maybe not a switch, but a, certainly a router or a traffic shaping device or a load balancer or a firewall, you actually bought a pizza box of some sort and had to plug it in somewhere and connect it in. And new devices like the CSR and, and the NetScaler that you just mentioned are now available as VMs so that you can bring up a, a, a customer application and give it its own load balancer without having to buy a pizza box and worrying about how to connect it in physically into the, into the environment. So it, it's the, the envi everything is changing very, very rapidly and in a lot of unexpected ways many times. It's, it's challenging to keep up. And I guess as we look okay. at the poll results, we're, you know, only 20% of the people say they're ready for anything here. Yeah, and it it doesn't surprise me to be absolutely honest with you. To, to your point, you know, uh, you know the what we what we try to do. I mean, it, it, with the joint development that and the close working relationship that Cisco and Xenos has is specifically to ensure that when we come to market with new releases of the MDC, that we have worked up front and validated Xenos and done the necessary development so that when that release comes to market, uh, the uh, the associated Xenos CSA product. Um, is is ready and raring to go. Yep. Yeah. Joseph asked if we supported the Cisco Thousand V, and yes, that's something we've been supporting. Um, it's it's a it's an interesting product because uh, it's the first switch that components are spread out across multiple systems. I think, which is which is really really interesting to deal with. So, Russell, something that you and I spent some time talking about is it's not even a technical problem. It's just the software licensing challenge. Yeah, any any uh, thanks, Ken. Anyone that has been involved with the nightmare that is service assurance licensing, this will strike a chord with um, something I've personally been involved in in, in in previous roles, and 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 it's a it's a major challenge if you think about the the way that bills and materials and licenses for uh, most assurance solutions are, are constructed. Uh, you know, you, you have multiple different components within that assurance solution. Each one of those components is licensed separately. You have to count the number of devices you have across your organization. Uh, the, the the way that you count your devices, you, you almost need a PhD to do it. I mean, it's the each vendor has a different methodology. They may look at a device and count it as four devices. They may look at it and count it as two devices. It, it's really not simple at all. But even once you get over that initial hurdle, as you grow and scale your environment, you need to keep going back to your vendor and having them basically reevaluate and say, well, now what's the right answer? Yeah, Now what's the right answer? And even minor changes to your environment, like the addition of a load balancer, could put you out of compliance with your existing uh, licensing regime. So the, so what's very interesting about the, uh, the, the work that Xenos and Cisco have done together is not just technical, it's even on this commercial side. So uh, Xenos CSA, uh, available through Cisco, so through the Cisco channel today, um, has a very unique licensing model for cloud. Uh, and what that is, is basically you pay per a VM or per uh, a, a hypervisor, and it's, it's your choice as the customer, whichever makes the most sense for you. Uh, but that license includes everything you need all the way up the stack um, aligned with VMDC. So you get everything from all your network services, we talk firewalls, load balancing, VPN concentration, et cetera, et cetera, your routing, your switching, your storage. Um, it, it just doesn't matter. You add memory, it doesn't matter. That license is all inclusive. It makes it a much more simple way to manage your environment. Even from a planning perspective, when you're doing your budgeting, it's much more simple to understand what your likely growth patterns are from a VM perspective than it is to look at maybe 100 different elements, each of which has a different licensing regime associated with it. It also makes staying in compliance a much more simple task. Yeah, let's, let's go to our third poll question here. And I'm gonna fill in a, a little bit of details there about some of the the, the work that we did, um, and I, the, when when we were developing the model, Russell, our key question was, we didn't want to have to count all of the, uh, you know, we didn't want to have to count a load balancer that might exist for two days that somebody adds to their service and we're managing it for two days and then it disappears. We didn't want to have to count the number of LUNs on a storage device that's going to change all the time. We didn't want to count a virtual. Uh, firewall contexts 
um, we wanted to make this, this very, very simple. And we figured the best way is to say you can manage all of the devices in this next-gen environment as long as you know how many server blades you have. And that was our first thought is just count the number of server blades you have. And we don't care how many operating systems you have or how many VMs you have or how many storage devices or how many network devices. Is There's one price just based on the number of server blades. And as we started talking to customers, we found out that a lot of customers like to count VMs instead of server blades. And so we, we, we developed an alternate pricing model that's the same way. But you still don't need to count all of those other technology silos, just these things that are, that are really easy to count. So I, um, I like to count on Sesame Street. There's nothing I'd rather do than count random things all day long. That's, that's an amazing. Um, now, I guess there was another question in here that, I'll, that I can handle really quickly, which is, do we have this available as a SaaS service? And there's a, I'll say there's a kind of a two-part answer here. One part is, yes, you can buy that from Xenos today. And the second part is, we haven't made that available through our Cisco relationship today. But if you want to deploy Xenos as a SaaS service, that is available today, and we have customers running on that now, and we're, we're ready to talk to you. So. Um, uh, yes, we absolutely do that. So uh, one other, another question here is, can I, and it's been asked by a couple of people, is can I get access to the slides and presentation after the meeting? We're certainly going to make a recording of this session available um, immediately afterwards. I think you'll get it in the mail. Okay. And you, could we close off the poll? Go to our wrap-up slides here. Yeah. Some people, some people like this, and some people would rather kiss a frog. There's nothing I'd rather do than count. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. So, Russell, we talked a little bit about the validation process. You do actually quite a bit about the validation process. And I think one of the most impressive things for me that came out of that is the, is the uh, Cisco validated design, which is available freely on your website for anybody to download. You can read more about this um, by going to well, not the IOE site, that's a, an internal site for Cisco, but it's certainly cisco.com slash go slash cloud assurance. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that, that's, as I say, freely available on, on the web. If you're a Cisco partner and you've got your uh, CEC login, you, you do get a little bit more information, but pretty much everything you need is, is available right there. As I said, it's completely free of charge. It's an investment that Cisco has made and, and, and people can take advantage of. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, so we've talked a little bit about that whole process. It's, it's a very substantial, very formal, very um, um, rigorous testing process. Um, it's very usual for us to come up against little roadblocks that we have to fix. It's not until you test in a system, in a, in a system context that you often uncover some of these very complex, niggly little things that often customers don't see until they actually deploy. So that's kind of the reason why we, we take this approach and why we make the investment up front so that our customers aren't the guinea pigs when they go and deploy this against uh, VNDC-based cloud environments. Um, that the, 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 as I say, the documentation is, is freely available. Um, it gets updated regularly along with VMDC releases. So when new VMDC releases come out, you will see uh, updated versions of Cloud Service Assurance. What people sometimes ask is how does Cloud Service Assurance, the, the CVD, how does that differ from the product itself? And that's a great question. The reality is, is that a product's a product. It comes with a certain amount of documentation. What you get with a CVD is a specific implementable design. Yeah? So it's actually the way you would go and implement it, deploy it and uh, all the different configs and that sort of stuff, and understanding the different scenarios that we've tested these things in. So it's really, a, it's really a, you can take it off the shelf, you can use it as is, or you can go and modify it to your specific needs. But whatever, it, whatever the case is, you'll find a significant uh, amount of the work has already been done for you, right? And again, what we're trying to do is to make it easier for people to go and deploy the Xenos CSA solution in a way that's a complete, answer, not just a point product that gets installed. So it's a, it's a product with a solution, a design overlaying it, uh, a config, and it's all tested as part of an overall end-to-end -end solution based on the VMDC or virtualized multi-service data center concept. Right. Now, put up some information here about some places you can go to learn more from this. And certainly, uh, cisco.com slash go slash data center is where you can learn about the, the, the Cisco's data center designs, including VMDC. 
Um, if you want to le learn about the VMBC specifically, you can go to go slash VMBC. And if you want to learn about Xenos Cloud Service Assurance, you can go to cisco.com slash go slash cloud assurance. There's a number of videos um, both on that site as well as on the Xenos user ID, and there's some links here for information. Now, what I want to do, Russell, is just leave this up and answer a few questions that have come in and just let us talk about them. Um, before I do that, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. We've had a, a pretty large number of people on this on the session, and I think hope this was uh, interesting and for everybody. Um, and thank you very much for joining. Uh, Russell, do you want to wrap up and say thanks as well before I we get to questions? Absolutely, yeah. So no, I, I'm very appreciative of people's time, and thank you, uh, Kent, for inviting me. Um, you know, the the the, the reason I'm here is because I'm really excited about the solution. It's a, it's a massive challenge. Most people like to think about infrastructure. They like to think about orchestration. Not a lot of people give love to the uh, operations guys, but we all know anyone who's lived and breathed operations that operations is actually where it all happens, where you can really make or break a cloud, where the promise of cloud, we're at the sharp end of it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So um, the, the, the fact that Cisco is focused on doing this, as well as those other areas I mentioned, tells you how important it is to us, how important it is to our customers. Um, it's certainly um, something that any cloud that's being deployed should be thinking about up front and not as an afterthought. So, um, and, and you know, very appreciative for the ongoing uh, close relationship we have with Xenos. Um, it, it's extremely fruitful. We have a great solution that does a great job, which our customers are clamoring for. So, um, very, very excited for the future here. Right, I'm blushing. All right, so we've got a bunch of questions in, and I welcome anybody who has uh, more questions to toss, toss them in now. I think we'll stay on for a few more minutes and answer as many questions as we can before, before we have to go. And there's a couple questions. The first, the first question, um, Russell, I think both of us can answer, which is, is Xenos, is Xenos uh, I guess, Xenos Service Dynamics different from Xenos Cloud Service Assurance? And I'll answer that um, by saying that the, the code base is the same, However, we've done a couple things for the, the, the product that we're shipping with Cisco. And the first is that we've got a, a packaged set, um, just as uh, Russell talked about, this has been validated and tested extensively. What we've done is got a, um, a pre-configured set of options that have been validated and tested and will work out of the box and are focused around the Cisco design. That doesn't mean we can't add the other, other components back in if you have some other some other company's routers or, or uh, some uh, uh, um, uh, Amazon easy, EC2 devices that you want to add into your data center, you can certainly do that. So from a technology's perspective, it's a lot of the same code base, but we package it up and have a very focused, very validated test. And the second thing that we've done is we've provided this simpler pricing model for the, for the Cisco that's available through Cisco. Russell, do you have any, anything to add into that? No, no, I think you covered it perfectly. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, okay. Xenos CSA is the product that's available through Cisco. It's specially configured. It's got a, a highly simplified uh, licensing model, and it, it's configured with all the options you'll need to monitor VNDC out of the box. But as Kent, you quite rightly pointed out, there is more flexibility than that there. So if you, know, if you were going down that path, there, is, there are options to, to expand that capability as necessary. Okay. Great, thank you. So then there's another question. I guess it's a two-part question. Um, we, we were talking about services or applications and how are they defined and are they limited to servers or can they expand the components on servers? What actually fits in these, these connections that show up automatically? And can these include um, parts of an application that are present on wildly disparate hardware? And the, the specific example in there was Amazon EC2. And what I'll, what I'll, I'll answer that. Um, we, we define these services um, to include any component that is manageable by Xenos. Okay, so if your application needs a a uh, a, a particular Ethernet interface, uh, for example, and uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of something in a particular uh, LUN and an Amazon EC2 machine image that's running, we can we can compose it of any any component that is managed by Xenos, and in fact, we can use some we can create some virtual components that exist only in the terms of events that are coming in from out, outside devices. So we have a very flexible way of defining these services. 
Um, I find that when I'm demonstrating, it's very easy to demonstrate as uh, just a, an app operating system that's running on VM, that's running on, on UCS, that's connected to a file system, because I think that's something that everybody understands pretty well. But we have an enormous amount of flexibility when we define these applications, and there's no reason that these can be composed solely of virtualized devices. So they can be composed of many different types of uh, physical and logical devices. They can cross uh, technology boundaries themselves. So you can define a data store up at the top level if you, uh, of service if you need to. Okay. Um, let's see if there's some more questions in here that I can answer. Um, okay. All right. Uh, looking at this, uh, I guess the question, there was a question that came in that said, I don't, I'm not quite sure what this means. It says HPOV slash BMC slash SCOM slash et cetera. Where's monitoring on this? And uh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, but a lot of, a lot of our customers have those applications installed. And if they're top level applications, they want to keep them in there to mon manage the rest of the data center. It's really very easy to connect a new cloud installation in just by feeding SNMP traps from Xenos that cover all of the components of the data center up to that top level system. That's, that's, a, that's a good way of doing that. Okay. I don't see any more questions right at the moment. Um, if, uh, if there are any, please toss them in. And if there are not, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And if you've got some more questions, please go ahead and, and write into info at xenos.com and I'll see that. Thank you everyone for joining. And apologies we went a few minutes over, but it was a great discussion and we didn't want to lose the momentum on that. So again, if you do have any other questions, as Kent mentioned, submit them at info at xenos.com as well as Check out the, the websites that have been listed there that you see and uh, the social media outlets. And again, thank you so much for, for joining us, and we hope that you have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.